Hey everybody, welcome to the book leads impactful books for life and leadership. I'm your series host and leadership performance coach, John Jeremillo. This podcast series is about getting to the books that have impacted the lives of people in my network. So these are great leads I'll be interviewing on those books. I want to know which book has contributed the most or a lot to who they are, what they do and the value they create. And there's three types of books I'll be covering in this series. One book, the first category of book is one that they'll be sharing with me. They'll be schooling me on the lessons that they've taken away from it. The second book is one that we've both read, whether before this series, we read it independently or specifically for this series. And then the third category is a book that they've written themselves or published themselves. In this episode, we'll be talking to um, an author of the book that we'll be covering. And for this episode, my guest will be David O'Brien, president of Workforce Solutions, LLC. And here's a little bit about David. Uh, David's human resources and organizational development consulting career spans 30 years and includes key leadership and P&L responsibility within a variety of industries, including manufacturing, healthcare, and financial services. In his current role, David is responsible for providing leadership and team effectiveness training, coaching, and consulting services to organizations throughout the United States. His clients include such market leaders as Aetna, Advanced Behavioral Health, Allied World, Behavioral Health Network, Chelsea Groton Bank, Dave Pitney, Command Aerospace, KPMG, Mass Mutual, Otis Elevator, among, among many, many more. He also works with many small and emerging market leaders, uh, as well as a wide range of nonprofit and government clients to help bring about sustainable improvements in organizational effectiveness. David's strong commitment to community service has resulted in him receiving several awards, including Employee, Employer of the Year and Business Leader of the Year for his volunteer work. He's a frequent keynote speaker on the topic of leadership excellence and has lectured at a number of academic institutions, including UConn, uh, the University of Hartford, Quinnipiac University, and the University of New Haven. His books, The Navigator's Handbook, 101 Leadership Lessons for Work and Life, and The Navigator's Compass, 101 Steps Towards Leadership Excellence, are currently available wherever books are sold. His third book, The Navigator's Journal, is expected to be in bookstores, uh, I believe, David, in spring of 2022. That's right. Yeah, next spring. And additionally, last but not least, as if David hasn't done enough and shared enough of his leadership wisdom, his articles have appeared in a wide range of local, regional, and national publications, and his case study, Leading Change from the Top Down, is featured in the global MBA textbook, Leadership Learning from Real World Cases. David, thank you so much for sitting down with me. Hey, John, it's so great to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, you know, you and I are both passionate students of this thing called leadership. And so it's just always nice to have these kinds of conversations because in it, uh, I'm learning, you know, and that's that's a really important thing. I know you're a, a student of this, too, as I mentioned. And and I think that's about what leadership is about, too. Right. I think uh, part of being a good leader is having that appetite to learn and get better. It never seems to stop. It, yeah, it never um, stops. Short of me going back to school for yet another degree, like this is one avenue. I, I think it's a bit selfish, but this podcast is one avenue for me to continue learning, mm -hmm. not just from textbooks like before, but from the people around me. So that's a great point. I mean, no matter how much you read, there's just always more to learn just because people interpret, uh, interpret it differently. Yeah, yeah, it's so true. And, you know, I, and I think we can learn from everyone. I, I've had that belief for a really long time. And I think, you know, uh, yesterday I had a keynote that I was doing. I may have mentioned that to you. It was one of the first live keynotes I've done in a long time because of COVID. I've done a lot of virtual ones. But at any rate, you know, I was saying to this group of around 60 people that one of the most important jobs that I have in, in being there as the keynote speaker is to tap into their wisdom. Uh, and that we take the time to think and share and learn together. And, you know, that reminded me, I, I hadn't done live, you know, live stuff before, you know, in a while, I shouldn't say before I've done hundreds, yeah. hundreds of them over the last 30 years, of course. But my point being, to your point, it's really about tapping into that wisdom like you with the guests that you have on this program and other work that you do, because there's just so much wisdom out there. And, and I think, you know, and you know this from your work as well, that, our role is tapping into that. And when we do that, everybody comes away with more, more perspective Absolutely. and more insights. And ultimately it, it makes the time a, a good use of our time. Right. Yeah. And, and what's interesting about this is people have said, 
oh, I'm interested in a book you covered for the series, but mm -hmm. you've already covered it. Mm -hmm. And my point to them is you can still come on because we just interpret things so differently. Yeah. So even if you read a book that I read, we're going to have different experiences to bring to it, different voices, different words, different vernacular, yeah. different tone, different everything. Yeah. So no matter what somebody's experience is, if you're curious enough to kind of learn from them, then there's just so much information, real world information, you know, yeah. human information that, um, yeah, you can get from a textbook, but conversations are just so much yeah yeah for yeah for sure for sure yeah so good so true so david uh as we start this why don't you give us a little background on your roles today some of the work that you do i gave a, a good chunk of it uh, a diverse chunk of it across the bio that that uh, i read yeah why don't you give you. us some insight on the, the various roles that you play whether it is in your organization or your volunteering Sure. So yeah, thank you. And that was a very kind introduction, John. Um, and so in, in my current work, you know, the last 21 years or so since I started this business, I was doing the same kind of work before with another larger organization. But the scope of my work really c remains fairly steady or, or, or constant in that it, it encompasses the coaching, the leadership and performance coaching, a lot of work around the keynotes, uh, but also uh, work around succession planning, employee engagement. Um, in my speaking work, there's really two tracks to that. In my speaking work, there's, it covers a lot of ground, but typically the themes are around employee engagement and accountability. I've done lots and lots and lots of work around that, those two areas. Um, and then, of course, leadership excellence and leadership awareness, uh, emotional intelligence, you know, so much of it all of my work really centers around the, the some of the deeply rooted beliefs I have that that leadership is a choice uh, and, and everyone can be a leader. It, it's not limited to people that have a job title or even direct reports, or frankly, for that matter, people that have a job because le leadership just encompasses so much more than that. And, and while that's, you know, reasonable to say, well, okay, you know, I, I, I work and I have some level of influence, but I don't have a title, that doesn't mean that you can't demonstrate leadership, right? And I know you know that, of course. And so, so much of that work is, is around those areas. And I think the central theme of it is helping to bring out the best in leaders, regardless of what their title is, regardless of what where they are in their career. Um, because I think that, again, it, it is a choice. And I think in, in many ways, it, it speaks to uh, perhaps one of the most important lessons I've learned about leadership in 30 years is that in many ways, leadership is an opportunity to be a role model for the behavior you wish to see in others. And, and let me just pause and think about that, chew on that, and I'll say it again. Leadership is the opportunity to be a role model for the behavior you wish to see in others. And, and I'm reminded of, I use a lot of quotes in my work, quotes get us to think, and I'm always, uh, I'm always kind of inspired by the various perspectives that people have on quotes. And that, that's part of the richness of, of, of sharing those and, and sparking those conversations. But my, my all-time favorite leadership quote is by Albert Schweitzer, who said, amongst other things, Example is not the main thing in influencing others. It's the only thing. And Absolutely. so when we think about that, we think about the fact that, you know, how we show up and what we're doing every day is setting an example and trying to be a positive role model for the behaviors that we wish to see in others, kindness, respect, authenticity, integrity, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think in many ways it starts with us. You know, we're, we're the leaders and we're the role models. And, and again, it's a choice that we make. Yeah. And I, I had met you in an online, uh, yet again, another guest that I haven't met in person because of the pandemic, but I met you because of the pandemic, a silver lining in these forums that we've been a part of, David. And uh, I think I've mentioned in those forums, my dad, where I can say that my dad is my hero. My yeah. dad is the best example that I've ever had of a leader. Yeah. And the curious thing about that, as I've mentioned in this series, is he never sat me down and gave me lessons. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? He, he yeah. corrected me. He but did he, by his example, John, right? Exactly. It, yeah. it, it, it's powerful just to say, yeah, he never sat down and gave me yeah. an explicit example, an explicit lesson. Yeah. You know, he disciplined what he had to, but the yeah. bulk of me and who I am as a person, who I am as a coach, yeah. you know, as you know, he passed away last December yeah. and- 
that really opened up. I always knew that he influenced me, but that really opened up just how much he made up who I am. So he, I just bring that up because it's such a powerful example. Oh, it's, of, such, a, it's such a blessing, you know, to, to, uh, to, to have had that experience and to know it at the level that you do. Yeah. Uh, you know, my, my dad was the same for me. Uh, and it's interesting you say he never really sat you down and had a, a, a discussion about it nor did my dad for the most part. There were a couple of times where I would ask him for advice, particularly as I got into different leadership roles because he, he was a very successful leader. But more importantly, he, he was a very good human being, uh, a man yeah. of tremendous faith, a, ma a man of tremendous values, clarity of his values, integrity and all of that. Um, and he made it look easy. Uh, but it, of course, it, it takes work. But the point being in, in support of what you're, you just shared, um, there's so many of those lessons that came out of just our observing their behavior, right? I mean, for me, that I would say 99% of what made him my leadership hero uh, was just from observing him, right? Oh, yeah. Not yes. not same with your dad, right? Not necessarily sitting down and saying, hey, we're going to talk about this element of leadership, yeah. but rather we're going to talk, you know, you're just seeing his, you're observing <laughs> his behavior, his yeah. actions, I mean, right? You know the way he would speak to people the way he would help people his work ethic his commitment to his family just all that i mean all that yeah you you probably have similar examples yeah. so david speaking sure. of you know we're talking about the past and and looking to our fathers as examples what was it that drove you into this field it was uh it really became an opportunity it, it really arose from um having some great mentors in my life uh, who saw my capacity. I started off doing training and, and my original role, my original journey was going to be within human resources. I thought I, I really early, very early on, I was doing talent acquisition, recruiting, and I really liked that. But one of my, my managers, uh, who was also a mentor of mine said, you know, you, you have, um, you know, we see you present in meetings and that kind of thing. And we think that you have um, some real good skills there. Would you like to be able to do more of that? And I thought, well, yeah, let, let's let's see what that's about. I'm curious, you know, because I hadn't anticipated that. I hadn't, and you know, I hadn't thought of that in any way or level. And um, and so I was given an opportunity to study under some really good people that were very effective in that way and that were highly skilled trainers and facilitators uh, and learned from them. And as I got deeper into that, um, I started, that's where my kind of the spark for my writing really arose from because I would work on these curriculum development teams um, in the early stages of helping them with, with some really talented people, some really, really talented people, highly skilled curriculum development folks, well-educated, well, you know, credentialed and so forth. And so they brought me into the fold and, and, and I got to study under them and, and work with some super, super talented people um, and, and contribute. And so then, you know, as I was getting deeper and deeper into that, I was feeling like, wow, this is really fulfilling. This is, I, I really like this a lot. And they say I do a good job and they're appreciating the work and contribution I make. Um, this, this feels like a really good fit. And then that led to more and more training and certifications, uh, including then getting into the coaching. Uh, this goes back, you know, 26 or so years, 28 years, getting into the coaching and getting some certifications there um, and doing, you know, more, a lot, lot more work around assessment and that kind of thing. And, and pretty soon um, it was kind of like, I think I found my groove, you know, uh, within a couple of years of doing that, and, and, and I think a big part of it, it I, I have to acknowledge that it was so much more about other people seeing something in me and and wanting to bring that that out in me. And that's leadership, right? I, yeah. I think that one of the great gifts of the leadership path is to help bring out the best in our people. Uh, I really believe that deeply, deeply rooted belief that that's, I think I call it the gift. In my first book, I talk about it as the greatest gift of the leadership path is our capacity to bring out the good in people, to bring out the best in them, to develop them, to see more in them and, and develop that. And that's what happened for me. You know, I was a, I was a product of that, so to speak, uh, because there were some great people in my life that, 
that cared, that took the time to uh, to help me, that gave me feedback and and guided me and so forth, and and became champions of mine in, um, in the early stages and later stages, of course, too. But but ultimately, that kind of guided me in that path, and and now you know here it is, thirty years later, and I, I get a I, I actually still get a very big kick out of it, you know, because it's. Um, it's just a journey that's that's been constantly evolving, yeah. and I've been learning, you know, and continuing to learn, of course, uh, over all that time, you know, which which to a point you made earlier, I think allows me to bring a lot of perspective to the work that I do. You know, I I haven't figured it all out, but you can imagine in thirty years, I've I've got some pretty good stories, and I've <laughs> you know, and I've seen I've seen some. I've seen good and bad elements of leadership. <laughs> let's, oh, yeah. put it, let's put it that way. Yeah. And things not, you know, things that leaders should do and not do, right? Um, oh, yeah. I think that's all a, a, a big, big part of it. So, so that that's kind of the the journey, you know. And then when I left that last corporate gig uh, 21 years ago, I had I through that organization and through those terrific people in my life, I had gotten promoted and promoted and promoted. Uh, to the point where I reached the level of senior vice president. Never imagined that, that I would become, you know, I didn't even aspire to be a vice president. I just really liked delivering, you know, good content and working on developing good content. I never aspired to run an operation or anything, but they, they, you know, they kept, you know, pushing me to do more and, and guiding me and cheering me on. And, and, and I got to that point, you know, and it was, it was all really great. It was a terrific experience, but then I came to that crossroads where I kind of thought, well, okay, what's next? And um, and I was traveling quite a bit at that time, an enormous amount. And so it became a case of saying, well, all right, I know what I like to do and I know what I'm good at based on feedback from clients uh, and what I really enjoy doing. And I think there's a correlation there. I'm sure you would agree with that. The things that we're really good at are also typically things that we're really we really enjoy. And so um, thank God. <laughs> yeah, right. Isn't that the truth? And so anyway, I, I and then that that was kind of all of that gelled together uh, 21 years ago um, to the point where I had the courage to uh, and the faith to walk away from that and start this business. So, you know, that was, it's hard to believe, John, I get such a kick out of it. It's 21 years. I had, you know, I celebrated the 20th anniversary in 2020, not the optimal scenario or, or world to be celebrating a 20th anniversary in, but nonetheless, I did. And, uh, and, and I think I, I was able to pivot well enough, you know, early on, thankfully in the pandemic to keep things going and to continue to build off it. Right. Yeah. So, so aside from, I can imagine that your father played an instrumental role in who you were, mm -hmm. that people ended up seeing and yeah. motivating you along. Yeah. Was there anything else in your environment when you were younger that kind of you think laid that foundation for that kind of development that others would see in you as a natural leader, as well, a natural facilitator? You know, it's interesting. You, you, you raised, that's a great question. And, and something that I, I, I thought of this, oh, maybe a few months ago, I was having a conversation with someone around um, the good good and bad sides of leadership, right? And somebody asked me, you know, when, when did you first start to observe leadership? Could you, could you put a, a finger on that? You know, how old were you when you started to pay attention to leadership? And I thought that was a great question. It parallels to, to some degree, an important degree to what you just asked. And, and, I th and, and my response was, and I had not thought of this before, uh, other, you know, other than a couple of months ago, I had not thought about it before. And now I'm bringing, this is bringing me back to it. And what I observed was in my growing up in my neighborhood, there were friends of mine whose parents were pretty miserable and they were being, you know, the impression that I got, and this, this is, I, I think back of this and I say, how, do, how did I figure that out? I don't know if I figured it out. I'm not sure I figured it out, but I, I did, I connected the dots, so to speak that their bosses were the root of what that frustration or anger was, that that was, yeah. a, they, they paid a, yeah. they played a big, because the conversations we it would be about, oh, Mr. So-and-so's boss is such a bad guy and he's so hard on him and, and he doesn't do this and he never honors his commitments. And, and this wasn't a lot of conversations, but it was enough for me to pick up on, probably in my teens, I picked up on this. And I began to think about, 
what what is this leadership thing all about? What is this managing thing all about? And how is it possible that that some people I know don't ever talk about that? And yeah. their their dads or moms, you know, seem to be okay. So what, and and that probably got my attention at at that early stage. But I think also being able to observe people that were that had so many of those foundational aspects of of true leadership, like integrity, the work ethic that you referenced with your dad, my dad too. He worked 40 years at the same place, you know, probably didn't have a sick day. Maybe he had a few sick days in 40 years, but I, I'll bet you could count them on one hand. And he yeah. was proud of that. He was proud of that, you know, and, and good for him. Um, but anyway, I think it's it's seeing those people in in different stages of life that just stand out as nice people or decent people or kind people and uh, and and my mom my mom exhibited that she she was a stay at home mom but she was a leader and influencer in the community in a really big way and and I and I observed that so that was a big influence on me too i dedicated my first book to my my dad and my second book book to my my mom yeah, yeah. it's amazing it, it leadership hit me when i got to graduate school mm -hmm. took a leadership course and you know certain book that i read it woke me up it was just kind of like wow this is the way it should be but yeah. in that moment yeah you think back to all me specifically my examples were the bosses that i had yeah i thought about the bosses that had good people working for them but they yeah. didn't know how to harness that didn't yeah. respect them so when you're when you are awakened to what leadership is what it yeah. should look like yeah. A lot of people that I work with, they start thinking back, not to, to their current environment, but back all the way back to maybe their first jobs. Yeah. And they recognize they can really put to a face the good leaders versus the bad oh, leaders. Oh, yeah. Whatever. So and, it's just so many examples all around us. Yeah. And, and that's such a great guidepost. That's a terrific guidepost. And, and, and the same for me, John. You know, there were... I had some really good bosses. I had some stinkers. You know, I had some yeah. really bad bosses. And and a lot of times, what I you know, I have, I have conversations about this stuff with leaders all the time. And and you know, one of the things that I I often hear, and I think it's true for me, and I, I bet it would be true for you as well. You know, those bad leaders, you learn from them in terms of the things you don't want to do, right? Like I'll never do that to my team, or that's a terrible way to treat people, or whatever it may be. But so there's lessons there too. But the, the real valuable lessons, I think, and I, I'm not so sure I can say they're more valuable because lessons are valuable. And, and if, if the lesson has to do with negative bad behavior that impacts my team that I don't do, well, then that's still a very important lesson, right? But there's also that lesson of the things that you can and should do that are the standout qualities of leaders that have inspired you, motivated you, engaged you, and all of that. And that you try to do more of those, but but you you would I'm sure be quick to agree. Sadly, there are a lot of leaders or managers uh, out there today who've had very few of those positive leadership experiences, and so as a result, they don't know the other way. They only know the bad stuff, and so they're micromanagers. They're condescending. They're abrasive. They're they don't honor their commitments and all of that stuff, right? Uh, they yeah. have low self-regulation, you know, in the context of emotional intelligence. They use foul language. They raise their voice. They're condescending. They're, you know, abrasive and all of that stuff. And 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 sadly, you know, they don't know any better because uh, that's all they've learned, right? They've only learned that. And I think there's, I think that's true in a lot of organizations. Um, but then, of course, the the question becomes, what's the cost of tolerating that? You know, yeah. what's the cost of allowing that? And, and I think. You and I know, and I think many of your listeners know that when you uh, when you allow it to happen, you endorse it, right? So if you're allowing that bad behavior to happen, whether you realize it or not, you're saying it's okay. You're endorsing it from an HR or, or leader, senior yeah. leadership perspective, um, and so it's something that you know. I think all leaders need to be mindful of. Dave, uh, now that you've given me your background, the work that you've done, how you came up to the field, what inspired you. We can jump into the book. Can you introduce the book, uh, your book? And, yeah, sure. Um, and how you came across or how you came to write this book? What was yeah, it that, so, that actually so, led you to pull the trigger yeah, on? So here, here it is here, the Navigator's Handbook. I'm trying to figure out how to get that up so you can <laughs> see all of it. Um, the Navigator's Handbook, 101 Leadership Lessons for Work and Life. 
And it really came out of the, the I think the catalyst for it was being on a couple of projects, doing the curriculum development, and that's a source of great joy for me. I, I really, I really get a big kick out of that. Uh, it's a lot, very satisfying to have be given, you know, a chunk of time and some resources and usually some money as well to develop a curriculum, develop a new training program. And I've done that, uh, you know, I've done many of them over the years. And well, anyway, this goes back. So that book came out in 2008. The first one came out in 2008. So it probably goes back to like maybe 2004, 2005 where I started getting feedback from clients saying, you should write a book. You know, this this content is really dynamite. It's really good content. It's very helpful. You know, we're we're putting all of our leaders through this program. And, you know, you should you should at least do a workbook, you know, but we think that you should write a leadership book. And I thought, well, that's very nice. They're just being kind, you know, <laughs> <laughs> who am I to write a book? Right. You yeah. know? And so that's, everybody goes through that, right. It's just the human experience. And anyway, I, I said, well, that's very nice. Thank you. And then I got that feedback again. And I got that feedback again. Um, and then I started to think, you know, and then I, I would share it with certain people in my, my life, you know, trusted colleagues and family and so forth. And I started to get the feedback, well, why not? Why aren't, why don't you write a book? And I thought, well, okay, you know, let me think, I'm gonna think about it some more. Well, anyway, to make a long story shorter, uh, I, I started to kind of think about, well, what would I write about? What would be important? And I, and I, and I have some, had some great mentors that helped me through this, that guided me. And, uh, and the first, the, the original intent of that book, The Navigator's Handbook, was that I was going to go out and I was going to interview somewhere around 50 to 75, maybe even 100 senior leaders, CEOs, typically CEOs, with a really good question set, and then take that feedback from those interviews and, and then look for the common denominators around leadership excellence, because that was the orientation of the book, and then distill their formula for leadership excellence. Well, what happened early on, and th this was not predictable. I mean, I guess some people, some people could have predicted it. I didn't. I didn't even, it wasn't even on my radar. But one of the things that I would do is I would interview you as the CEO of XYZ company. And then, and then as a part of that process, I would interview two other people in your organization to try to validate what I'm hearing, right? To make sure that I'm, I'm getting the real story. And what I, what, what started to happen early on was, so I would interview two people from your organization with a similar question, question set to try to validate what I had heard from you. And what was happening was people were volunteering, volunteering, no question that got to this point, uh, this information, but rather volunteering that John is not only a great leader here, he's a great leader outside of here. And I heard that again and again, and it got me very curious. Why are they telling me that? what's the correlate what's 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 behind this i got to understand this because i'm not i didn't hear it once or twice i heard it a dozen times independent of any question that would get to that answer and so then i began to kind of reframe it and ask the question why why do you say that i figured that was an easy path why do you say that why would you volunteer that john's a great leader outside of work as well as in work and that answer became fairly consistent so much so that I can capture the, the thrust or gist of that feedback in the following statement. And that is right from one of the people that I interviewed. She said, you know, John is not only a great leader here at our company, but he's a great leader outside of here because he's not only really clear on his values, he's really clear on how he lives those values. And that just, that was a light bulb moment. I, I mean, I had done work around values before, but I had never made that correlation. And, and out of that, you know, came one of my favorite words, which is congruence, right? And so congruence is about just that. It's about walking the talk, right? And, and really effective leaders have that all day long. They are, they operate from a place of clarity of values, purpose, and those, and those, those values that are aligned with their behavior. And so that, that opened up a whole new world of thinking about the book. And then what would happen would be, I would do those interviews and I'd look for that information too. And then I would come back and go through the notes and I would think of stories that I had experienced or heard or lived in many cases 
that further illustrated what you told me. So then I started to, to kind of, to really enhance the story and to add more depth to it, I would tell a parallel story that in my mind illustrated it really well. Well, anyway, I went down that road for several months and then I came to a roadblock that said, wait a second, this is becoming my story. Uh, this is not about my story. I want John's story. He's the CEO of XYZ company. You know, He's got a 500 person operation. He's a $4 million a year CEO. I want his perspective. And so I froze. I, I, I basically came to a roadblock where I thought, well, I don't know what I'm going to do here. And so I took a little bit of time off from it. I said, you know, I like the idea that these stories do enrich the story that I'm hearing from the CEO, but this was not going to be, this was not meant to be my story or my book. Well, anyway, then as life would have it and faith would have it, people intersected in my life at the critical points who said, yeah, it is your story. You need to get really clear on why you're telling the story. Um, and you need to get clear on the, the why. It's really the why, right? And you, you, you understand that, the Simon Sinek. Yep. philosophy and thinking on getting to why, right? And so I did. I, I thought about the why. I thought about why am I writing this book? What's the purpose? And, and that became so crystal clear um, within a few months that I got right back on track. And I still did some of the interviews, but I looked deeper into the stories that I had. And then I framed them within the chapter sequence that I had already worked through and refined. Uh, over the years, but the net result was that journey was three years, John. Wow, it took me three years to finish that book, and I and I was probably seventy percent done, and I got stuck again, thinking that this is now all mostly my stories, and then I got into that self doubt that you know so many of us go through, uh, and then somebody came into my life who said, no, this is your story, and you got to come back to that why and and get clear on it, um, and then look at the really big picture of what inspired you to do this. And what inspired me to do this was my father. And so when I got that, that was like such a breakthrough. I have on my office wall here uh, a sticky note that I wrote the day that I made that connection, the day, the very day that I made that connection that the big picture here, the why really was at the deepest level, was to honor my father and his leadership legacy. Um, and I wrote something on that, on the sticky note um, that basically said, happy birthday, dad. <laughs> and my goal was to, to finish it by his 100th birthday. He sadly didn't live to be 100, but um, my, all of a sudden I had this whole level of clarity that said, this is, this is to honor him uh, and to try to share some of his leadership uh, behavior, wisdom, perspective, truths, whatever you want to call them, uh, in honor and respect for that. And so then I said, okay, my goal now is to finish this by his birthday. Uh, and I finished it the day before. Wow. And that was like seven months out. That was about seven months from the, the day that I had that realization, that light bulb, um, where I wrote the sticky note, uh, which is still on my office wall today. Uh, it was seven months. And I, and I did it. I finished the day before. Yeah. I, I chuckle only because I think when I, I had that aha moment about my same similar kind of thing, I, not that I was writing a book, but just the work that I'm doing, the passion I have for it and why, yeah. Yeah. I don't know what I was doing, but it just hit me. And I literally out loud, I was like, holy shit, yeah. because it, I just connected how much all of my work, everything that I do, the reason I do it is connected to my dad. It's, yeah. it's amazing. It's, a, know, it's powerful. You know, that's yeah. why I said it was a gift. You know, when I said to you earlier, how, what a great gift that is that you Absolutely. have that level of clarity. Right. You know, and, and I know, I, and, I, and I bet for your motivation behind it there, of course, is so parallel, which is great. It's a joy to, to hear you share that with me. Thank you. But also it's about trying to create more better leaders, you know, because the, at, the, at, a, at another level, for me, it was about remembering some of those childhood experiences as, of, as, of observing really toxic, I mean, not firsthand, but hearing stories about really toxic bosses and thinking about that and, and having this realization that bad leadership, toxic leadership has this ripple effect that, that touches every part of that person's life. 
their kids, their spouse, whoever it may be, um, significant other, whatever it may be, it has a far reach of not of negative impact. And so I thought, well, gee whiz, if I can if I can help to create a few better leaders and and bring true leadership to this world, that that's a pretty worthy thing to spend my time on. And if I can if I can do that a few times, that's that's a pretty good use of my time. If I can do it more, that's a blessing. But you know, I I early on I thought, oh, I'm going to create a million leaders. Uh, I've you know I, I thankfully I got a lot clearer about that early <laughs> on and said, well, you know, one is good, you know, and it starts with me. I'm the one. I, I'm going I'm going to become a better leader, and and if I can become a better leader, I can inspire that in other people. Even if you just inspire one person, I, yeah. it was amazing when I started this work, how just even inspiring one person. Mm -hmm. Or one person telling you this blog post spoke to me or yeah. what you commented in this class or when you spoke at this event, even yeah. if just one person one steps person. up to you, you really need to take into account how you may have shifted somebody's life. Going back yeah. to what you said, David, about people recognizing in you what maybe you didn't see, but it was mm -hmm. these particular roles that changed the course of your life. Oh, unbelievable. All yeah, it takes I mean, is I would have never conversation. predicted it. All it yeah. takes is one conversation, one yeah. comment, one piece of advice. So yeah. it's a great ripple effect. Yeah, yeah. I wish I often joke around with friends saying, I wish I could tell you I had planned this all out, you know. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> I had the I, I had the work ethic, you know. One of the lessons my dad taught myself and my brothers uh early on was that you're gonna have to work for a living. Yeah. And and you know, there's the right way to do it. And the right way to do it is to get an education and then work really hard. Be, be willing to go the extra mile, work hard, you know, don't be above any job, do what it takes to be successful, do what it takes to add value, whatever your job is. It's really about adding value. It's really about making a difference, whatever job it is. And so always being willing to go that extra mile, um, and, and go, I, I, you just inspired me to tell you this story. It's in the first book, the 5% formula. And it's, this is in honor and, and tribute to my dad. So I said early on in our conversation today that there were times that I would ask him for advice later in life, primarily later in life. Um, because most of my, my lessons for him were from what I observed, as you had said about your dad. But I remember one time in particular, I had promoted, I had been promoted to a manager job and it was a new, new role for me. And, and many of the people on the team were older than me. Uh, some were my dad's age. And so it was really kind of awkward for me from going to be a peer on Friday to the supervisor manager on Monday. And I didn't want to mess it up. You know, I really didn't want to mess it up. So I remember saying to my dad, hey, give me, give me, just give me one nugget, you know, give me one nugget. What, what's something I can do to keep it on track and, and not let these people down? And he said, the 5% formula, you know, it's worked for me all my life. And I thought, wait a second, you know, I was like maybe in my early 30s. I never heard this 5% this thing. I'm like, where, where is that coming from? How come you never told me that? Yeah. And, and, and here it is. It's simple, but it's powerful. He said, you know, I've come to believe that a lot of people talk about giving 110% of themselves and that's what it takes. And he said, the truth is there's no such thing. You can only give the most you can give is 100% of yourself. But what happens sometimes is to be successful and to meet people's expectations and to, to add value doesn't necessarily take 100%. In some cases, it could take 80% of your effort. Some cases, 95%. But one of the things that always will be true is it always takes giving 5% more than people expect. And if you can give 5% more than people expect in every mm -hmm. single thing you do, you will, you will find that it is a tremendous impact on not only your job satisfaction and happiness, but ultimately on your success in that job. And so I remember that, and, and it's in the book, The 5% Formula. It just stood out for me as such a great example of, of how really effective leadership doesn't have to be complicated, right? Yeah. It, it, that's so easy. I mean, that's a, to me, it's such a, its power is in its simplicity, but it's so true, right? To just give 5% more than people expect, and, and, and in his exact words, in every role you play, 
And that just doesn't mean work, you know, and, and I know you get it. And I know many of our listeners do too. Le leadership is, is a 24 seven gig, right? Yeah. It's not limited to this space called work or Monday through Friday or eight to four, whatever, whatever the norm is, right? It's everywhere. So anyway, that's a shout out. I had, I had to get that plug in for my dad. No, I absolutely. Figured, I figured you'd appreciate it. Uh, David, can you provide, is the list in the book, is it broken up into certain sections or is it just yeah. a general yeah. list or what? Oh, no, if, no. If they are broken up into sections, can you just kind of give a summary of the arc of, you know, from the start of the book to the end? Yeah, or? So, so it, 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 the start of the book, so they're broken into chapters in a sequence that, that lays out the thinking about navigating. And so navigating really is that connection to that discovery about congruence. So navigating really is about operating from a place of our moral compass. I believe our, our values reside in our moral compass. And so when I think about those leaders who were walking the talk, who were considered great leaders in and out of work, the, the, the correlation for me was they're operating from their moral compass. And that moral compass is, again, where our values reside. And so the compass correlation to navigating is just that. Navigating is allowing us to use that moral compass to be really clear on our standards for ourselves and others, but also our values and how we live them. And so, so the first part of the book is setting that example and, and, and setting that, that understanding and creating that context. Then I go into what gets in the way of it, what, what prevents us from navigating. Um, and a lot of it's in our head, of course, uh, other people too. But, and then I take the people on a journey from setting the stage, setting the example of, of how this navigating theme came about and why it works and what gets in the way of it um, to then getting deeper into the self-awareness as a leader, going into emotional intelligence, going into leading through organizational change, style differences, personality types. And so it's really about being able, and, and the whole navigator theme is woven throughout the entire book. And so the with each of the topics, whether it's organizational change, emotional intelligence, performance management, whatever the topic of leadership that I'm touching on, the whole theme of navigating is woven through it. And so what's what I think is especially helpful, and I've had this feedback from many, many people, thankfully, is that each chapter, each of the 10 chapters, concludes with 10 key lessons from that chapter, and then five activities for applying those lessons. So every single chapter has 10 key lessons uh, that, that should be remembered that capture the essence of what the chapter presented, and then five activities for building a navigator culture. Because you know the you know this, and I know I'm sure all of our listeners do as well. Um, this is not something you do solo, right? Uh, good leadership involves a lot of people. Creating a culture where people are thinking like leaders and being leaders and stepping up and and giving the five percent that I talked about a moment ago. Uh, is something that takes all hands on deck, right? And so these activities, uh, specifically they're called activities for building a navigator culture, are ways of engaging your team in these kinds of conversations in a very, in a very deliberate, uh, kind, safe, respectful way to get them talking about what these, these behaviors are, uh, what the what the impact is on the team, what the impact is on job satisfaction. You know this too, John, that there's a great correlation between that, our level of job satisfaction and how we're operating like that, right? Yeah. The, excuse me, the people that are are complaining and, and, and uh, always passing the buck are generally not happy people. They're having a pretty bad time. Yeah. But the people that are stepping up and going the distance and taking ownership, are generally people that are pretty cool. They're, I mean, the uh, cool is not the right word, but they're, <laughs> no, they're, they're cool, they're cool, too. They're they're cool, cool to too. work with. Let's put it that way. They're a lot more fun to work with than the whiners and complainers, right? And I've been those, by the way. And that and that's kind of, I think that's part of the early stage of the book. It kind of, it, I lay out my continuum of getting to that level of clarity and then taking it into the context of what did I do? What have I done? to prevent that and to and to not let that level of clarity in and how did that impact my job satisfaction 
and how did it impact my success? And so, so it really, it really sets the stage for that. There's a lot of really good stories. There's a lot of stories in there, um, you know, that were part of the original plan and then expanded on. And, and I think that, and I use quotes a lot too. Every, every chapter starts off with a very specific quote that is intended to get people to think about what this topic of leadership is and why we should pay attention to it. Um, and then, and then it's chock full with stories. And I, I know I've had a lot of really nice feedback about how the stories resonate with people. People learn from stories, right? Absolutely. And I know that. And so there's stories that illustrate they, uh, the, the idea really behind the stories is to illustrate the point, right? To illustrate the point that this is in, here's a story that illustrates what I'm talking about in that chapter. And, and frankly, there's, many many chapters have multiple stories it, it, it's just for me it's it, it creates it it paints the picture it creates more clarity yeah so. and david now having learned about you your background the work you've done the breakout of the book what it provides yeah. i'm always curious with authors that i interview what are the lessons that you've taken away from the book um whether it is the feedback you've gotten how you've looked at things differently how your views may have evolved what is it that you've taken away from yeah. from that book it's a terrific question john thank you and and at the very top of the list is the daily reminder that there's no off switch on leadership that's number one there's no off switch on it i can be a leader in every single role i play or every single day and so and then also, the, you know, probably right after that is that leadership excellence is really a journey. It's a continuum. Um, and so that I have to be sharpening that saw and paying attention to it and working on myself. It starts there. Remember, I said a little while ago, well, if I only develop one leader through this journey and that's me, that's not a bad thing. Right. I mean, I, 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 I like to think it's more. And I know I, I know from some experiences it has been because I've had those that feedback like you just you shared a little while ago from people reaching out to me and saying how this point meant touched them in a particular way or, or how it resonated with them very deeply, how it changed the way they were dealing with something, whatever it may be. But and, and that, I think that's a big part of it wanting to help people like that. But anyway, so I, th I think it's about there's no off switch on leadership. I can be a leader and role model in every role I play. It's a continuum. It's a journey. I got to keep working at it. I got to do the, you know, it's an inside job, so to speak. I got to do my work um, and keep at it and keep open to learning and different perspectives and, and, and even be hungry for it, you know. Yeah. I read a lot. I just read a whole lot of stuff. People are always sending me articles or recommending books. And, you know, I, I just have a big appetite for that. And and I think that's what keeps my brain going. And to me, that's a big part of it. You know, the, I write largely to create clarity. Uh, you know, I've said that for, to people for a long time, that I, the reason I write is to really solidify or cement even uh, my own truths about that particular topic. Uh, and that and that's how I do it. You know, the, the more I write about it, usually I do a quarterly article, of course, and have for many, many years. And I usually spend the full three months working on the article. Wow. It, I have not, to the best of my recollection, been able to write a good article in a week. I can't remember a time that I did that. Maybe a four weeks, you know, because I, I really get into the zone and I have the time to work on it. Because for me, writing, I, I wish I could say it, write, writing comes natural for me. It's easy. It's never easy. It takes me, you know, I have to clear my mind. You understand that. You have to clear your mind. You have to get really focused and you have to kind of give yourself permission to hang out in that space and then think deeply. Um, and that part I enjoy, but um, yeah, so I, I work on it pretty long, you know, like a couple months, three months, usually. You know, so people, Dave, people, when you... When you talk about the articles, what kind of articles are we talking about? So, I mean, obviously leadership, but what do they look like? Yeah, I mean, yeah. So, so two, two of my all-time favorites and probably the most widely published, probably starting with the most widely published, published in other parts of the world, uh, even convert, even translated into Spanish, uh, is my uh, One Question That Matters article. And the one question that matters is simply this. How easy are you to work with? Um, and that whole that whole article explores 
the correlation between your answer and the level of job satisfaction that you have at that particular time. Um, and, it, and it's got a really, it's got a very effective inventory, a self-scoring inventory. The navigator inventory is what it's called that looks at these accountability navigator behaviors and you get to do that. Um, and that, that article and the navigator inventory has been translated into Spanish as well. Uh, the article was translated into Spanish. It's been published all over. That's a, that's, that's a great article. That, that, that one took me probably a few months, at least a couple, three months too. Um, but that's a big one, uh, the one question that matters. And then following that, another one that's been very popular that's been published in and around the outside of the U.S. as well as all over the U.S. is deliberate leadership in a distracted world. And what it looks at is explores the, the, the reality, the norm that we're all living with as leaders and this was before the pandemic, but it's even more appropriate or poignant now, uh, of the fact that we're all distracted. We're distracted. We just live in a society that's full of distractions. It's hard to spend time thinking about any one thing for more than a few seconds. Uh, we, you know, we In some parts of our culture, uh, multitasking is considered uh, you know, a strength. I don't think it is. I, I don't think we're allowed to do our best work when we're trying to juggle five things at once. I know for me, I do my best work when I can focus and think. And so this, this article, Deliberate Leadership in a Distracted World, explores the impact of being distracted and then strategies for, for managing your distractions and becoming more deliberate in your leadership. And it's, uh, it's, gotten a lot of, it's gotten a lot of press. It's gotten a lot of press. And I've done it, I turned it into a keynote too. I had- awesome someone had read the article and they said, do you have this as a keynote? <laughs> I said, when do you need it? You know? Yeah. 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 We could do it. I could do it as a keynote. So, so that's one, another one, another one that was just popping into my head. I have maybe 30 or 40. I can't remember for sure. They're all on my website, by the way, or the majority of them are on my website. But um, another one that stands out is how a new legacy mindset changes everything. And, and I've been thinking, you know, as I said early on, I do a lot of work around employee engagement. And so I'm always thinking about what else, you know, how do we get, and there's tons of data out there and there's a lot of really good stuff out there, right? But I'm always curious, what's next, you know? How, how do we sustain it? You know, there's a lot of things we can do to, to boost it up a little bit, right? You and I know that. There's a lot of things you can do, but how do you sustain it and take it even deeper? And so this is another one of those articles that I know I, that one I probably didn't have, but I probably spent four or five months writing that article because I knew I had the nucleus of it and I had this theory, this thinking, but I just had to put my head around it and really get deep into it. But anyway, yeah, it's how a new legacy mindset changes everything. And, and the, the, the essence of it is re-examining the concept of leaving a legacy uh, and, and stripping away the the I think that there's self-imposed parameters like related to age or a stage of our career. If you strip those away and you think of legacy in the context of leaving things better off, um, why do we have to wait till we're in the fourth quarter of our career to think like that? Why, why do we have to wait until we're in a particular level of our career to think like that? What would happen if we all thought like that now? Yeah. And so that that are that's gotten a lot of good press too, and that's one that I'm really jazz. I get really jazzed up about it because to me it's like a new, in my mind anyway, it's kind of a new frontier of engagement that I haven't seen anybody talking about, and that kind of motiv that motivates me, you know. Yeah, yeah, I mean it's amazing to get that out there. Um, as you said, some of those translated into other languages across the world. Yeah. So, uh, David, when it comes to, I mean, for this particular podcast, there's the specific lessons that people can take away. Uh, but at the same time, if somebody's not in the leadership field, I want this to kind of speak to everybody out there. Yeah. Anybody that's curious about leadership, regardless of background, yeah. regardless of profession, yeah. how can you translate? And this is what I love about leadership yeah. uh, is that it is transferable. So how would you transfer? How would you articulate? Um, 
just an overview of the book and how anybody in any field could take value away from your book. Yeah. Um, so I, I think the first thing that comes to mind is so much of it is about choice, right? But even before that, it's about we all have influence. Everybody has influence. Influence is not limited to people that have a job title or work. It's influ We all have influence. And so I think it's about realizing that there's so many choices we make. And, and a big part of what I explore early in the book is how our attitude influences our behavior. And, and so I often, I often frame it in the context of how are you showing up? You know, one of the questions I ask the leaders I work with frequently is, how are you showing up? Are you setting a good example or a bad example? Uh, do people want to be around you or not? Are people better off? One of my mentors one time, one time said to me, she summed it up and she said, you know, it's really simple. Either your team is better off for spending time with you or they're not. And I thought, wow, that's a really powerful statement. And the same is true for people in our life. Either they're better off for spending time with us or they're not, whether it's family, friends, neighbors, faith community, whatever it may be. And so the question becomes, how are we showing up in those relationships? And is it our best? Is it the best version of ourselves? And do, do we operate in a place where people want to spend time with us or not? Because I think when we're at that place of, personal leadership, accountability, clarity, awareness, and all that, generally people are more apt to want to spend time with us. And, and this is not, not by any means a measure of, hey, I want people to spend time with me or not. But I think it's really about being able to be mindful of that role model opportunity we have. You yes. know, back to that very early point, we all have, we are all role models, period, the end. There's no escaping that that's universal. And the question becomes, what example do we set, right? And how much of it is driven by our head, you know, our attitude? To me, that was, the, that was kind of the game changer early on in the book because I got to look at how my attitude translated to my behavior in the various roles that I played and how that behavior impacted my job satisfaction or misery. You know, I mean, that's the truth. There were times in my life where I didn't like my job at all. And I, I counted down the days till retirement. Not, not necessarily a good way to spend your days, right? I think we underestimate the power of choice. Yeah. It's, uh, I it's think, choice. I think we kind of are just programmed to play the, the hand that we're dealt yeah. um, and not really making the choice to proactively take a different route, learn about yeah. a different method, learn about something else, a different culture, a different discipline. So yeah. I think, yes, at the very, at the very beginning, I think it, it's, it is huge. It's about choice. Mm -hmm. uh, David, can you give us a little breakdown or maybe a preview of what your upcoming book is going to be about? Sure. It's, it's a continuum. It, it's, it's really, and, and at this stage, I have stripped away the expectation of having 101 anything in the subtitle. Um, <laughs> I, I was, you know, my, my publisher said, oh, you have to have another 101. And I said, you know, that's limiting me. I, I'm trying to figure this out and work within that box. That's not what I want to do. I, I, I want to get into the deeper lessons from the first book. And that's really what it is. It's taking those lessons. Remember, I talked about the lessons in the first book. So each of those each of those chapters concludes with 10 key lessons. And it's taking what I believe are the most critical lessons of those and going deeper into them to, to get to the why. Why is this such an important part of leadership? And so the, 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 ex the way it exists today is taking it into that deeper dive, spending more time on it. You know, for me, it's, it's, a great, it's great to tell the story and make the illustration through a story, but I think it's richer and, bet, and more learning to really kind of dissect some of those lessons to really get deeper into the why. And so it's my hope and expectation that um, I'm, I'm hoping that I'll be close to finish by the end of this year and then the whole cycle of, of publishing and all that is probably three or four months. So my estimation is that, you know, by April or May, it should be out. But at any rate, the idea is, again, to follow a similar framework, and that is practical strategies for bringing out the best in your own leadership, as well as bringing out the best in your team. I, I, I think that's really the the essence of, of the first two books. And, and that's been my my 
kind of guideposts all along uh, as I work on the third book. Awesome. Looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to finishing the first one and then reading the second one and then the third one coming out. Thank you, John. Um, and, and what's crazy is everybody says, how many, how many books can you read on leadership? Mm. But I mentioned it earlier in this episode where people have different languages. They have different words that they use. They have different tones that they use. Yeah. Um, so you could take 10 coaches, have them pick one topic that they're all going to write about that yeah. same topic. Yeah. And I would read each book because they have a different way of looking at it. Sure. Absolutely. You know? Yeah, that's a good, that's a really good point. And, and, and through that, you're gaining more perspective, right? I mean, I think that's a, that, and that's what this is about. You know, the, the, the broader perspective I have on being a good leader and getting better at this, um, you know, the more impact I have, yeah. the more value I bring to the relationship or the or the workspace or whatever it is, right? So it's a continuum as we we both agreed to early on. David, obviously this episode is about your book, but outside of that, what's one book that stands out to you? You know, I, I was thinking of that early. There's a lot of books. I've got a lot of books going. And that's a that's a good point of reference. You know, so I said early on, people are always recommending books. And I and I pick them up. Sometimes people send them to me. And I, I will be very candid and say, you know, I probably have read half of them and the other half I've skimmed. Because sometimes what I'll do is I'll just skim a book and say, well, I wonder what they say. Well, let me see what the chapter sequence is. Oh, there's a topic I'd like to hear what their perspective is. But okay, so here, here's one that continues to stand out. The Go-Giver by Bob Berg, B-E-R-G. Um, it's a wonderful story. I was doing a speaking engagement. Now, this goes back a couple of years. I've read a lot of books in between that one. But that's one that just keeps standing out for me. Uh, the Go Giver by Bob Berg, and any yeah, the Go Giver. And anyway, someone came up to me at the end of the program, and she said, "Have you read the Go Giver?" And I said, "No, I, I'm not familiar with it. I had heard of Bob Berg." Um, and anyway, she said, "Oh, you have to get the book." And then the next day, she had sent me an email saying, "Have you ordered the book yet?" And I thought, "Well, I guess I have to order the book." So I stopped what I was doing. I ordered the book, and I read it on a Friday night. It came on a Friday. It's a it's a fable. It's a great story. But um, I, I recommend that for all the leaders I work with. It, it's just, it's just, it's it creates context. It creates context in my mind about mm -hmm. the true power that leaders have to have a positive impact on people. That's a big one. Um, true North by Bill George. Yeah, I have is that one. Another favorite book. Uh, Max Dupree, Leadership as an Art, oh, is wait, another wait. favorite book. It is. Yeah. Oh, you got it. Yeah. Yeah. Man. I, I just love one. I, I love that one. I yeah, just, yeah. Yeah. I just first ordered first time, it. Yeah. I, I haven't started it, but I just ordered oh, it. Oh, it's, it's dynamite. I quote some of his stuff in there. That's yeah. a good one. Um, you know, the good to great by Jim Collins. That's a terrific book. Yeah. It's uh, funny. You brought up. Good, there's a lot of good ones out there. It's funny. You brought up go giver. You, yeah. you mentioned the title, didn't know what it was about, but then you mentioned it was a fable. Have you ever read um, The Alchemist? You know, it's interesting you say that because I did many years ago and I just recently ordered it. Okay. My wife had read it and and she, she also read it a long time ago. I read it. And um, in fact, I have it right behind me here because I we said, you know what? We got to get reconnected. Paul Colello, right? Yes. Yes. Colello, yeah. Yeah, and so um, I I I know I know I need to read it again, uh, but yeah, I know it's a wonderful book. Yeah, it was just uh, it was funny when you said I think you had said story or fable, so it wasn't yeah. like you know a leadership specialist writing about it, but it was a, a fable, a story. That's exactly right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where yeah. those where those lessons can come to life. That's so. where those lessons can come from. Yeah, and that that that. I, I enjoy those, you know, there's a, yeah. there's a lot of them. I mean, go, going back to who moved my cheese, you know, Spencer Johnson, you know, that was a so fable simple. or, or, or some of Patrick Lencini's work, you know, the five dysfunctions of a team, the, uh, the five temptations of a CEO, you know, some of those, those are all good. And there's a lot, you know, one of those things, one of the things that those all have in common is they're quick, easy reads, you know, that's, I like that, you know, I mean, <laughs> 
<laughs> Anytime I, like I open up a great book and it's got short chapters, I'm not, I love reading, but if yeah. it's short, concise and to yeah, the point. Yeah, I can, I can get through it. Yeah. I like that a lot. So, so yeah, just keep me apprised of anything, any thank, good books that uh, go yeah, my way. I'll do the so. same. And, yeah. And thank you so much for the opportunity to spend time with you today. Uh, you inspire me. Uh, hey, and the, the feeling is mutual. I mean, we've only spoken a few times, but I mean, in sharing stories of our dads, like you get a good sense of where someone's coming from. So I appreciate that. Thank you, John. David, aside from our conversation on the book and other books that, you know, we've referred to each other, what, um, what else might you want to share? Anything that you're up to? Anything you want to mention at all? Well, you know, I always encourage people to check out my website, workchoicesolutions.com. Uh, you can see it right there. The, no LLC in there, just workchoicesolutions.com. There's uh, learning resources on the website, which has got a drop down menu of all kinds, a lot of my articles, some of the assessments that I've developed and used, uh, the case studies. There's just a lot, a lot of stuff there. And it also has updates on where I'm speaking and what's next, you know, my public, my public uh, programs. Uh, and so forth. So people can kind of keep track of that. I'm always, I invite people to link in with me on LinkedIn. Um, I keep track of, you know, there's always postings there. I do a, a monthly leadership quote on social media that, you know, is intended to get people to think uh, about leadership and their role as leaders and influencers. So those are just some of the things, you know, um, people could check that out. There's a lot of material there and it's all intended to share, so to, to just share with people uh, to keep the conversation about leadership going and keeping it keeping it going. So I love it. David, thank you so much for sitting down with me. I really appreciate it. Thank you, John. I look forward to having another conversation with you, not to this in future. Definitely. No, we'll pick one of those books. Yeah, that yeah. Up and, and we got to go out for lunch, you know, got to go out for some good Colombian food. That's what <laughs> there I'm you go. About. There you go. I like <laughs> the way you think, Dave. Hey, um, right back at you, buddy. But uh, yeah, I'll post your links with the uh, with the show wherever I post it, so people right. will have a good sense of where to find you. Okay, Thank you, everybody, for watching, for listening. If there's anything that I might have missed that I should have asked, again, there's so much to cover in a limited amount of time. Just let me yeah. know. Shoot me an email. Comment on social. I'll make sure David gets the question if there are any. Yeah. Um, and in the meantime, thank you, David, again, and to everybody else. Take care. Yeah. Thank you, soon. John, and best wishes to all. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Thank right. you. Bye bye. -bye.